biodiversity, conservation, ecosystem services, and economics. So I think that's something that um, obviously is, is uh, relevant and of interest to, to most people here. Um, and also, I, I, I would like to say I'm really grateful that you're here on the last afternoon after lunch. Um, I, on Tuesday, when I uh, was talking to people, and I talked to three out of my four friends who I knew well coming in, and the three out of four of them said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to miss your talk. I'm going to be on the train at that time. So anyway, you're now my new friends by being here this afternoon. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me get into it. Now, you know, the 20th century was in many ways a remarkable century. Um, and if you were interested in economic growth, it was truly a spectacular century. So we went from roughly $1.1 trillion per year in real uh, income per year in 1900 to $41 trillion, right? We mean a 41-fold increase roughly uh, over uh, uh, 100 years. Um, obviously, you know, people are more familiar with population going from 1.5 billion to 6 billion, but, but you know, the economy just uh, had massive, uh, massive growth. Um, but of course, along with massive growth comes massive consequences, some good. I mean, you know, if you look at life expectancy or other things, obviously this has had, growth has had a, has a positive side, but uh, it's also had a tremendous negative side. So uh, this is just one example, a uh, paper that many of you probably are familiar with uh, from Johan Rockström and, and colleagues. Uh, it was published in Nature about you know, where, where are we? Are we outside of sort of safe operating space for humanity? Have we exceeded uh, what is sustainable? Have we exceeded where we should be? So uh, it's interesting that uh, you know, the ones where we're really well in the red zone, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, nitrogen, you know, the one that we, we worry a lot about, climate change, I mean, it's out there, but not, you know, this one is way out there. So, how should we be thinking about this as we go forward? Right? So, in the 20th century, if our objectives or our economic system was geared towards uh, maximizing GDP, uh, what do we do now? So, what is the new objective? Uh, how do we think about going forward? Uh, if we have a new objective, uh, say sustainability, well, what? is to be sustained, is it biodiversity, is it human well-being? I'll come back and talk about that at the very end. And, and how do we know when we're making progress towards this? So if we have a new objective, we also need new measures. And I've just put out the title of a, a cover of a book that came out a few years ago. Many of you may be uh, familiar with this. Um, two out of the three uh, uh, authors, lead authors of this book are Nobel Prize winners in economics, but basically making the point that many people in this room have made, which is, we need to think differently, and we need to have new measures to replace our old measures. You know, we, we did spectacularly well on a certain slice. We, we did very well at raising GDP. Now can we think about doing well living on the planet? So one way of thinking about this is right now, we're sitting on the inside trying to look out, especially look out at nature, and we lack the right set of measures or accounts to really know what the full impacts are. So, Distorted views lead to distorted decisions. So can we fix that? Uh, I'd much rather prefer looking at this picture, seeing more clearly, and can we uh, clearly account for nature and bring this into uh, decision making? This has been a theme. There we go. This has been a theme throughout uh, the past uh, decade or more. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, thinking about. We're clicking here, I think it's about 10 clicks. Okay, so the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, was trying to take the pulse of the planet. How are we doing? What's the measurement? Um, initially thinking about measuring you know, status and trends of ecosystems and biodiversity, but ending up in a very interesting place. And I think a place that was uh, foundational for things that came after that, including uh, T and the Natural Capital Project and other things. So ecosystems and biodiversity are essential for human well-being. Right? So e that's, that's really a notion of ecosystem services. So how do people benefit from what's going on in ecosystems? And how does biodiversity support this? Okay, so, you know, 
the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was good because it was bold and it said it is, you know, biodiversity and ecosystems are essential for human well-being. But it said that at a time when it could not necessarily back up all of those statements. So moving beyond the MA, there was really a call to the science community and also the policy community for saying, well, what is the evidence? When do we know when we're beyond safe uh, limits or boundaries, as the Rockstrom paper? How do we know whether decisions are good or poor? So can we provide evidence of the value of ecosystems and biodiversity? And can we, not just on the science side, but on the policy side, can we mainstream the value of nature? In other words, can we bring this in so that all decisions uh, this gets reflected? And it's not just the environment ministry, but the finance ministry, the mining uh, interests all have to take this into account when making decisions. So I want to walk through these sort of how I take this on and uh, thinking about how do we mainstream ecosystem services. And there's really sort of three steps that I like to try to bring together. The first one is primarily a natural science question. It's understanding the provision of ecosystem services. So if we do something which affects ecosystems, how does that change the functioning or structure of ecosystems and lead to changes in, in services? And then the second is, how important is that? What's the value um, either to uh, either the biodiversity itself or to human well-being? How does human well-being change as we do things that change the provision of ecosystem services? And then the third is, how do we actually mainstream? How do we get implementation on the ground, decisions which reflect our values? So I, I think spatially, and so let me just pictorially, so let me just uh, give you an example. So the Natural Capital Project, which I'll talk more about in a moment, but in, in thinking about this, we're really focused on decisions, and decisions at two levels. So at the top level, you could think about at, uh, say, a government level or an international organization, how do we set the framework? How do we provide a set of incentives by which people who make decisions on the ground, so individuals or firms that take actions on the ground that then uh, affect ecosystems? Uh, so let's think about what kinds of incentives or what type of framework both the high level decisions are made and the decisions that people make on the ground. Now, we could actually stop here and do sort of a purely, in a way, purely biophysical analysis and think about, well, what are the impacts on ecosystems or what are the impacts on biodiversity? And, and leave it aside. So I'll call that sort of non-human based or non-anthropocentric approaches. Um, part of the issue, however, if you really want to mainstream, you've got to speak to the majority of society. And so not talking about how this impacts people means that you're not speaking to large segments of society. So can we go further and think about what are the impacts of changes in ecosystems on the provision of services, things that actually impact on, on human well-being? And I call these ecological production functions, but basically it's, you know, what, what changes as you change the ecosystem? How does that affect water quality or flooding <coughs> or recreation um, or crop production or other things? Now again, one can stop here and speak purely in biophysical trade-offs, right? So, I grow more crops here, I drain a wetland. How does that lead to increased crop production, but a decline in, uh, say, water purification services, so water quality downstream, or habitat? And so we can think about those trade-offs, um, just as uh, in their own in kind, of, kind of units. Now that's one option. The other option is to talk to the social scientists, economists, but other social scientists, and think about how important are these things. So I'll talk in kind of economic terms here about benefits and costs, but again, so what are the impacts of decisions and how do those impact people and how important are those? So how would people in the system view, uh, you know, is this a net benefit if we drain the wetland and we have more food but we have less clean water or less recreation? Is that a good thing overall or not? So that can then feed back into also all of these things, all this information, the biophysical information or kind of the economic information feeds back into hopefully the policy decisions so that policies actually reflect our values. And of course there are other considerations here, so fairness or procedural considerations that also are going to affect um, how, we make, how we make choices. Okay, so let me get on and I want to spend just a second talking about the Natural Capital Project. Some of you may be familiar and others less so. This is a partnership between four organizations, 
two academic organizations, so Stanford University and University of Minnesota, and, and then two.